silence and we stand. Yes, Mr. Nessie. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, Your Honour received a letter dated the 26th of May 2015, which was received this morning from Cardinal Pell, and I've tendered that letter. Yes, thank you. The, uh, Is there a copy? Letter. Is there a copy somewhere? Uh, yes. I think I'll mark it as an exhibit. We'll make it 2833. Thank you, Your Honour. The uh, Cardinal indicates at the end of the letter that he would like to make it absolutely clear, and I quote, that I am willing, as I have always been, to give evidence should the Commission request this from me, be it by means of a statement, by video link, or by attendance in person. Yes, thank you. I call Jared Ridsdale. Is he on the screen? He should be on the screen very shortly, I'm reliably told. Mr Ridsdale. Mr Ridsdale, can you yes. hear me? Can you hear me? I can me? hear you, yes. Uh, and can see me too? Yes, I can see you now, Your Honour. Uh, just before I ask you to take the oath, we need to make sure your volume is satisfactory. Can you? Uh, I didn't hear what you said then. I didn't. Right. Well, you, you need. You have to make sure. You have to make sure what. You need. You need to be sworn to tell the truth. Do you understand? Yes. Do you, do you wish to take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? An oath, an oath on the Bible. You have a Bible there? Yes. Would you take the Bible in your hand, please, and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God... ..that the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission... ..that the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth yes thank you you can put the bible down now and miss finesse will ask you some questions mr richdale would you tell the royal commission your full name gerald francis richdale and Mr. Ridsdale, you're currently incarcerated in a jail in Victoria? Yes, I am. And you're in jail, Mr. Ridsdale, because you've been convicted of various offences, haven't you? Yes, I have. The first occasion on which you were convicted was in 1993, and you were convicted of three counts of indecent assault against girls in Edenhope in 1976 and 1977. You remember that? I don't remember. I don't remember what, um, what the convictions were or the people involved in, in that first 1973, was it 1973 appearance? It was 1993, Mr. Ridsdale. Do you accept from me? 1993. That you accept from me that you were convicted of those offences? Oh yes, yes, I understand that, but I don't remember the any, any of the details of that. You were next convicted in 1994, and you were convicted of a total of 46 offences involving 21 victims, 20 boys and one girl, all under the age of 16 years. And the offences were committed between 1961 and 1982 throughout the Western District where you were appointed as a clergy in Bendigo, Swan Hill areas and later on in Melbourne. 
you pleaded guilty to those offences. Do you remember that, Mr Ridstone? Yes, I remember that. And as a result, you were sentenced to 18 years and you were eligible for parole after 15 years. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And then in 2006, you were convicted of some 24 counts of indecent assault on a male person under 16, seven counts of gross indecency with a male person, and four counts of buggery. And those 35 counts related to events from January 1970 to April 1987. And as a result, you were sentenced to 25 years and six days with a non-parole period of 19 years and six days. Now, that's why you're in jail at the moment, isn't it, Mr Ridstone? Yes, that's right. And then further, in 2014, you were convicted of 30 charges, four charges of indecent assault on a female under the age of 16, 24 charges of indecent assault on a male person under 16, one charge of carnal knowledge of a girl of or above the age of 10 years and below the age of 16, one charge of buggery of a male under 14 years, and that offending took place between December 1961 and December 1980. Do you remember that? Yes, I do remember that. And as a result of that, you received an effective sentence of 28 years imprisonment and subject to parole. You will be 88 years old when the sentence expires. That's right? That's right. And you pleaded guilty to all those offences, didn't you, Mr Ridstar? I did, yes. Now, in a period in 1994, when you were out of jail following the 1993 conviction, and before you were jailed for the 1994 conviction, you were asked to talk to lawyers and insurers for the church. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that interview at all. Now, you have a bundle of documents with you, don't you, Mr Ridsdale? Yes, that's here. And there's someone there to help you with that bundle, isn't there? Yes, no, I've already had a look at some of that statement Well, this can morning. I ask you... Thank you, Mr Ridsdale. Can I ask you to look at tab 107? Someone might get that up for you. Yes, I've got that here. And you see it's headed transcript of interview with Gerald Francis Ridsdale, that's you, at the Pastoral Centre, St Francis Church, Lonsdale Street, Melbourne, on 6 June 1994, between 10am and 2pm. You see that? Yes, I see that. Does that help you remember that interview? No, I've got no recollection of that interview at all. Uh, you see that the first question was where you were born and educated. And yes. What is recorded is what is said that you said about your date of birth and your education. Now, yeah, yeah, um, date of birth. Now, if you uh, just... There's nothing there about date of birth, just where I was born. And then where you lived and what schools you went to. Yes. And all of that is true, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, but I've got no, uh, no recollection of the interview, but what I would have said then, I, I presume, would have been true. So you, you accept that... So this... I'm, accepting, I'm, I'm accepting what's in the document. As what you said at the time, even though you now don't remember telling them. No, no, I don't remember it at all. But you accept that what you would have told them in 1994 was correct? Well, I think so. You've got no reason to think you wouldn't have told them the correct things in 1994, do you, Mr Ritzner? No. no. Now, I'm presuming it's correct. Well, 
I'll take it to various parts of it during the course of today, Mr Ridsdale, and if you don't think anything's correct, you tell me. Okay. I will. Now, you were born on the 20th of May, 1934. That's right. At St Arno. Yes. And you moved to Bendigo when you were young and went to primary school in Bendigo? That's right. And then to, you moved to Ballarat when you were about six or so and went to St Aloysius, Aloysius Primary School at Ballarat? Yeah, yes. And then you went to the Christian Brothers Primary School in Ballarat? Yes, I did. Did that Christian Brothers Primary School have another name? No. Uh, we just knew it as Drummo because it was in Drummond Street. Uh, we just called it Drummo. Did you make any friends at that school that lasted through most of your life? Oh, I don't... I don't think so because... I mean, most of my life would have been, would imply to me that I'm still in touch with them or still know them. Brendan, but I don't, I don't think so. Brendan Davey was a friend of yours at school, wasn't he? That's right. And I don't know whether we were at Drummo at the same time. And he became a priest later on, didn't he? Yes, he did. He's a good friend. I beg your pardon? He's a good friend of mine, yes. He still is. Still is. Still is yes. a good friend. And he visits you in jail, does he? Well, he was chaplain here for some years. So I have seen him regularly until he retired. You've seen him regularly as a chaplain at the jail, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. He's visited you after he's retired, hasn't he, in the jail, in fact, quite recently? No, he, ha he hasn't, I haven't seen him since he retired. When was that? Oh, three, four, um, probably about August or September, I think. What year? It might have been, it might have been later, but I think it was before Christmas. Last year. Yes, I can't be sure of that, though. Now, can you turn back to that document that I was talking to you about before, behind tab 107? Have you got that in front of you? Yes, I have. And you've got the first page open? Yes. Now, just turn to the last paragraph of that page that begins at, at St. Patrick's Ballarat at school. Right. Oh, that, that's the name of the, yes, that's the name of the Christian Brothers School of Drummo. That St. Patrick's it was St. Patrick's. That you call Drummo. Yes, that's right. Yes. Now, you told in 1994 that there were three different occasions of a sexual nature you remembered when you were at that school. You say that the first was by an older cousin who stayed at your place by night. You would have been about eight or nine and there weren't many beds, so he was put into bed with you and you remembered in 1994 that he molested you by playing with your penis. Do you see that? Yes, now that I see that. That happened, didn't it? Yes. And then further down that second page, you describe another memory, which is of an uncle who, as you saw it in 1994, was making advances to you and putting his hand on your knee and up your leg to your crutch. Now, nothing ever came of it, but you thought in 1994 that it was kind of a sexual testing sort of thing. 
that happened as well, didn't it? Yes, that, that did. And then the third matter that you, in 1994, had some vague memory of was being in a hall, whether it was a school or parish hall, and a Christian brother, you were pretty sure it was a Christian brother, fondled you around the genitals outside your trousers and you were about 11 or 12. Now that happened as well, didn't it? Yes, as far as I remember. Thank you. Now you were at St Patrick's... Well, I, don't, I, don't remember, I don't remember it now, but I, I accept that the memory was there when, when I made this statement. I've, I've got no recollection of those things happening. I've got no clear picture of those now, if you know what I mean. But you don't doubt that when you told the people who were inter interviewing you in 1994, you were telling them the truth? I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'm accepting that as the truth, even though I don't remember it now. Thank you, Mr Whitstone. Now, after attending high school at St Patrick's College, you left school at age 14 and began working at an accounting firm? Yeah, that's right. And when you were in your third year of the accounting firm, you considered becoming a priest? Yes. Why did you consider becoming a priest? Where are you, um, where are you in the document now? You've gone back to the first the page. Don't worry about the documents so much. Just listen to me for the moment. All right. You remember working at the accounting firm? Yes, at Cooks. And you remember thinking about becoming a priest? Yes. Why did you want to become a priest when you were about, I think, in your late teens? I don't know. I've always thought it might be the influence of... Uh, a parish priest that we were friendly with, Father Dan Boylan. Was there anyone in your family who was a priest? No. Did uh, priests regularly visit your family's house when you were growing up? Yes, because the church was across the road and uh, between church services they'd come across for breakfast and you looked up to them, Mr Ridsdale, didn't you? Yes, I did. And they had quite a deal of status in your community when you were growing up? Yes. Is that why you wanted to be a priest, so that you could have that status? I, I don't know now, and I don't know what whether I'd be conscious of it then. You say you talk to your priest friend Dan Boylan about becoming a priest? Yes. Do you remember now of anything he told you about the life of a priest? No. The only thing I can remember about uh, any conversation with Dan Boylan with regard to the priesthood was um, he was talking about spiritual books that I was reading and I remember him saying always remember when you're reading books like that that that's not necessarily how people like that lived but that's how they would like to have lived and I don't know why that stuck in my mind but that's something that I've always remembered. He didn't tell you how it was that the priests actually lived? No. What he said was such as to persuade you that you should enter the priesthood? So well, when I told him I was when I told him I was thinking about it, he seemed just happy happy that I'd made that decision. Did you talk to your family about whether you should become a priest? Yes. What was their reaction? Um, 
Oh, initially, I remember Dad saying he was disappointed because I was studying accountancy and he always thought to have an accountant in the family would be handy. But I don't know whether he was serious or joking about that. Um, but from, from memory, they were both delighted. Mum and Dad were both delighted. Did your mother think that it was bringing status on the family for you to be a priest? Uh, I think so. I think that would have been the case in those days. Now, you then finished your school leaving certificate before becoming a priest, didn't you? Um, yes, I had to go back to school for a year. And then after finishing your certificate, you went into the seminary at Werribee. Yes, that's right. Do you remember the seminary at, Mer at Werribee? Yes, I remember it. It was called Corpus Christi College, wasn't it? That's right. And you were there for about two years? No, it would have been five, five years. Now, just coming back to that document that's in front of you, Mr Ridsdale, do you see at the top of the page there's a series of numbers starting with CCI? Yes. If you can just turn over to... Do you see 0029 at the top? Yes, yeah, that's page 5. Yes, that's page 5. Now, you were asked towards the bottom of the page, was there any discussion or any instructions given to the seminarians on matters sexual in those days? of sexual behaviour. Do you see that question? Um, yes, yeah, I see that now. Can you just read out your answer, Mr Ridsdale? Well, that paragraph starting, not in Werribee... That's the paragraph. Not in Werribee, I can't remember anything. My biggest problem there was masturbation. And I remember going to my confessor and confessing it, and he said something like, you will have to stop that, or otherwise you have got to leave the seminary. That was the kind of attitude there towards masturbation, etc. Now, if you just turn over the page, Mr Ridsdale. And you say few lines down that you didn't know a great deal about it, that is masturbation, except that you... No, I see that, yeah. And you say, yeah. except that I just felt guilty, I knew it was wrong, I was told it was wrong. Now, were you told that it was a sin to masturbate? Yes, a serious sin. And how did you reconcile being told it was a serious sin with being in the seminary and wanting to be a priest? How did I reconcile masturbating yes, which you with wanting to be a priest? Yes. I don't know. Did you do it by going to confession and telling your confessor what you were doing? Yes, I would have confessed it. And did you think after you'd confessed it, you were then free to continue doing it because you'd received absolution? Well, that, that wouldn't have been the... I don't think that would have been the thinking that I was free to do it. Um, I would have been hoping that I, I could stop it. You couldn't, could you? No, I couldn't. You 
say at the top of that page that you were hoping there would be specific sexual instructions at the seminary. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that, but I don't know why I said that. I don't know. I, I can't remember in the seminary hoping for specific sexual instructions. Did you get any? Not that I... Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I can't remember. Looking back now, Mr Ridsdale, do you think it would have helped you if during your time at the seminary there was more talk about sexual matters and how they related to being a priest? Uh, yes, I do think it would have. How would it have helped you? Uh, well, I think it would have to go alongside with um, discussion about personalities, um, relationships, it would have to be tied into a, um, a bundle about how to, how, to, how to live, different areas of living and relating, not just an isolated sex instruction program. That's how I see it now, but I don't know how I would have seen it then. Do you think that if you had a being part of a discussion about personalities and relationships and the like, you would have thought that the priesthood was not for you? Yeah, that's, that's hard to say now looking back on it, but my, my desire to be a priest was so strong and I think this might go back to what you said before about the status and family expectations that I just wouldn't have wanted to, to leave the seminary. But if somebody... I would, had would have been... wanted to, I would have wanted to stay on regardless and just, just push on. But if somebody else had been participating in those discussions with you, and they had thought that you weren't suitable for the priesthood, they could perhaps have stopped you becoming a priest, couldn't they? That's right. And that didn't happen? No. Now, while you were at Werribee Seminary, you knew that you had an attraction to boys rather than women? Yes, I see that here, yes. And that you, while you're at the seminary, you remember going to a camp for underprivileged children? Do you remember that? Yes, I see that here. And if you go back to page two, that's page two at the top of the page. And down the bottom of that page, you see the last two lines? Can you when read? I was in the seminary. Yes, can you read that for us? When I was in the seminary at Werribee, probably, um, and that was going out and helping on camps for underprivileged children. Now, just a just vague just, kind of, yes. Just let me stop you there. You see the question before was, when did you first recall any molestation by you of a younger person? And what you've just read out is your answer to that question. Yes. And then if you can continue that over the page at page three, starting with the word yes. Um, yes, but again there is only a vague recollection of sleeping close to a lad and cuddling, but I have no clear recollection of any masturbation, nothing clear. It seemed to be just a need for intimacy 
hugging and closeness. Now, did you feel the need for intimacy, hugging and closeness while you are at the seminary? Did I feel the need for it? Yes. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. You mean with other, with other seminarians, other adults any, or what? With any person, including an adult. I think I've always felt a need for closeness. And have you experienced that with adults in your life? Um, uh, you mean the, the cuddling closeness, s sexuality aspect? Yes. Um, not, not really, except um, for a three year period in prison, mm -hmm. where I had a close relationship with another prisoner. Just coming back to page. There's reference further down the page to what happened in the seminary. And there's reference to an allegation that was made about you, and then you refer to having some kind of memory. Now, the name of the person doesn't appear here, it's been blacked out. But you say that you have some kind of memory of being sexually involved with another person who was a child. Now, do you remember that now? I, I, I'm a bit lost. I don't know where you are. Just have a look at page three and go down to yes. the halfway where you say, I do have some kind of memory. Do you see that? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Of being sexually involved. Sexually involved, yes. With a person who was about 12 years at the time. Right, but all that kind of stuff that he has there just doesn't make sense. Now, you were being shown a statement that that person had made about what happened. Does that right. help you? Not really. And you were told that this person was saying that just before you left for Genoa in Italy, it happened. Does that help? I can see it here, but I can't remember anything about it. It doesn't it doesn't help. It doesn't bring anything back. Thank you. Now, while you were at the seminary, Victor Rubio was there as well, wasn't he? Um, yes, I think he was a few years ahead of me. I wouldn't have had anything to do with him in the seminary because he would have been a senior, there was a kind of a division between the, the first four years and the last four years. We didn't mix much. What about Brian Coffey? Was he there? Who was that, Brian Coffey? Yes. Yeah, Brian Coffey was probably one year ahead of me. Were you friends with him? Well, I would have been. But in, in a general kind of way. Did you keep up with Brian Coffey after you left the seminary? Yes, because I've, um, I've worked in the diocese with Brian Coffey mm. and I would have seen him at meetings, um, conferences, and then I... Um, and I was corresponding with Brian Coffey for a while. Was that when he was in jail? I think, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think he got sick and retired. And I, I think I was writing to him. We, we don't write now, but I know I was writing to him for two or three years, probably, from jail. So you were in jail and he was in jail when you were writing to him? 
No, no, I was in jail and he had retired, was living privately in Ballarat. So this was when you were in jail after 1994? Uh, yes, it would have been uh, well, probably uh, 10 years ago. Well, I can't remember, but probably about... You know that he was, uh, he pleaded um, not guilty to offences against children in 1999, but was ultimately found guilty? Do you know that? No, I know that he was in, um, I know that he had to go to court. Mm. I can't remember the outcome though. Mm. Did, you, did you write to him after he was convicted? Well, I, I would have, I wrote to him, um, I was writing to him fairly regularly, like a couple of times a year, because he was just among the friends that I, that I wrote to did you know before, every year. Did you know before you heard of the charges that coffee had been offending against children? No, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have guessed. Wasn't something you and he talked about? No. What was your reaction when you found out he was being charged with offences against children? I was surprised. Why were you surprised? Saddened. I was surprised. Well, I just would never have thought it of him. And I was saddened. By what? What made you sad? Sad for the fact that he defended. Now, with Brian, uh, with Victor Rubio, you know that in 1996 he pleaded guilty to two counts of indecent assault against boys, don't you? I've heard that, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you hadn't kept friendly with him after the seminary, had you? No, not at all. We had no contact at all. What was your reaction when he pleaded guilty to those counts in 1996? I don't know. I, I wouldn't remember, I don't remember now of him being in court or being convicted of anything. It was just news. And that was news that occurred after you had been convicted and jailed, wasn't it? Well, I can't remember when it was. Well, it was in 1996. I don't know what year. It was in 1996 and you were in jail at that time, weren't you? Yes, yes. Did you write to Victor Rubio after he'd been convicted? No, I don't think I've ever written to Victor Rubio. Now, he was I'm never in my circle of he was never in my circle of friends or, or on my like mail list sort of thing. After the seminary, you went to Genoa in Italy to continue your studies? Yes. And then after Genoa, you went to the United Kingdom? You went to Dublin. Well, you went to Kent as well as Dublin, didn't you? Not to study. What did you get, go to Kent for? Went there for a holiday. Didn't go there as a housemaster in a school. Yes, that's in this statement. Perhaps if you can turn to page seven, Mr. Ridsdale. Yes, yes, I read this this morning. So you see about halfway down, you talk about <clears throat> being in England and getting a job as a housemaster. Yes. And then you remember there was one lad there. Do you see that in the transcript? I see that, yes. Can you just read what you say after that? Uh, what, which is the paragraph? The paragraph is about halfway down, beginning in No, Not in Italy, and about three lines down, where after a semicolon, 
it begins, he was a bedwetter. It was. Um, it, it someone was next to you can point I, it out for you, Mr. But I do remember there was one lad there, he was a bedwetter, and one night I discovered that he had wet the bed, so I took him in to where my room was and got him fresh pyjamas, and then I said, we will get into bed here as your bed is wet. And I'm pretty sure that I fondled his penis. I don't know if I masturbated him. He would have been perhaps 10. As far as clear details, I do know and can remember washing him and putting fresh pyjamas on him and then, then getting him into bed with me. Thank you. Mr. Ridsdar, before we get too far away from it, I just want to go back to the seminary and the confessional. Uh, did you have a confessor in the seminary? We, yes, we, I, I forget whether we chose a confessor or whether we were allotted but you a had confessor. But you had a regular confessor? Yes. How often did you go to confession? I don't remember, Your Honour. It could have been once a month. It could have been every two weeks. I'm just not sure. What did you understand you were supposed to confess? All sins. What did you see to be sins? Uh, all of those that were against the commandments of God and the commandments of the church. Now, when you left the seminary, did you continue to go to confession? Uh, I did. Um, I did for a while, but not regularly. When you say for a while, for how long did you continue to go to confession? Oh, maybe three, four, five years. I, I can't really remember, but that's just the impression that I, I sort of have now. And were you honest in what you confessed to your confessor? No. What did you not confess to your confessor which you should have? I didn't confess the sexual offending against children. You were then ordained priest into the Diocese of Ballarat by Bishop O'Collins in 1961? Yes. When you were ordained, did you tell the bishop of your sexual offending while in the seminary and while overseas? No, I didn't. Did you tell anyone? I don't think I told, would have told anyone at all. Did you have any particular friend as a priest when you were ordained in 1961? Uh, I suppose the closest friend I would have had would be Brendan Davey because we'd grown up together and he was, um, uh, he was ordained with me at the same time. Did you we tell worked Brendan together Davey? in... I beg your pardon. No, no, I never told anyone. I never told anyone. You didn't tell Brendan Davey? Sort of thing, it's the sort of thing I wouldn't tell anyone. Why is that? Uh, looking back on it, I think that the overriding fear would have been losing priesthood. And you thought that if you told anyone, you'd lose the priesthood? Yes. Because what you, you were doing was a crime, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. You were then appointed to relieve at various parishes in the diocese, weren't you? Yes. And you were appointed to Horsham, Inglewood, Camperdown and Ballarat North. You remember that? Yes, I see that here in the document. And you were relieving there, weren't you? Just filling in while someone would have been sick or on holidays. 
Now, that page that you've got open, page nine, you were asked whether in those various relieving appointments you had any sexual association with boys. And you said that you remembered that in Inglewood and Camperdown. Camperdown, yes. And the boys, the first boy in Camperdown was not an altar boy. That's right. Uh, the one in Camperdown wasn't. He wasn't an altar boy. That's right. It, it says he is in this list. I must have had a list of those that I'd been charged with, I think. Do you remember now how you met the boy in Camperdown? No, and I don't remember who it was. I don't remember any circumstances or details there. And you um, talked about the boy in Inglewood being an altar boy. Yes. And that was in 61 or 62? Yes, because I was filling in there in the first, first few months, I think, after ordination. Did you tell anyone of what you were doing with the boy in Inglewood and the boy in Camperdown at the time? No, I've never told anyone. Now, you were then appointed after Inglewood to assistant priest at Camperdown, and that went to a diocesan consultors meeting. Now, did you know back then that there were consultors in the diocese? Yes, they were the senior priests who met with the, the bishop to make decisions and as far as we were concerned that the decisions that affected us were the um, appointments to parishes. So you understood that every time you were appointed to a parish, either as priest, assistant priest or relieving priest, the consultors were involved in deciding where you were to go? Well, I presume they were. I think that was the usual procedure. You never went to any consultors' meetings, did you? No. Did you ever have a conversation with someone who you knew to be a consultant about whether or not you should go to a particular parish? No, I don't think so. I don't remember ever doing that. Did a consultor ever come to you and say, look, we've got to make a decision and I know you're interested in a particular parish. Can we talk about your work as a priest? No, I don't think it worked that way. I think it was um, mainly done through um, letters, through correspondence, applying for a parish or being appointed to a parish. But when you say it was just a letter in the mail. So you'd write saying, I want to apply for a particular parish? Yes. If a parish was becoming vacant, uh, I think the general rule was that priests would be notified and asked if anyone was interested, they so given a certain time to apply for it. And then you were told in writing whether you were appointed or not? Yes. And do you remember any time when there was a discussion by someone on the consultors committee after you had applied and before you were told what the outcome was? No. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it worked that way. Now, you were convicted of uh, indecent assault against a boy while you are at Camperdown? Many convicted, years later. Um, it's not in the document. I'm, I'm, not sh I'm, I'm just not sure what you're referring to there. Do you remember now that one of your convictions was in relation to a boy who you offended against in Camperdown?
that we were leaving? No, I can't remember. The, 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 uh, the names of, of victims, of those I've offended against, in those, those early um, appearances at court. So you were then ultimately moved to North Ballarat Parish in 1962? Yes. And when you were at North Ballarat Parish, you were an assistant priest? Yes, I would have been assistant priest for a number of years before becoming a parish priest. Part of your work as an assistant priest there was to work at Nazareth House? Yes, I was chaplain at Nazareth House. And Nazareth House was a place for girls? Yes, it was. And you were at Nazareth House for a couple of years? I, I'm... I'm not sure how long I was at Ballarat North. But you were at Nazareth House while you were there? Yes, yeah. The normal, been... the normal uh, time for, be, for an assistant to be in a parish was three years. But it wasn't always, didn't always work out that way, but that was the normal procedure, to be there for three years and then to be moved on. And moved on because your time was up. Yes, yes. For a parish priest, uh, parish priest, I think I don't know, but I think in those days it was about five years, unless there was some sort of circumstances for keeping the parish priest on there longer. Well, we'll come back to you as a parish priest. But you were convicted of an offence against a girl while you and she were at Nazareth House, weren't you? Yes. Now, if you can turn to page 18 of the transcript you have. And you see four lines down. It said the first complaint. Yes. Can you just read that paragraph, Mr. Ridsdale? Uh, the first complaint that ever came in was in my first year as a priest, and that would have been Ballarat North, because part of my responsibility was Villa Maria, a little school run by the Mercy. It was a little boarding school for boys out near Xavier Golf Course. It says Mount Bogey, but I, I, I don't, I've never heard of this, Mount Bogey as far as I know. And it was in the Ballarat East area. But in those days, Ballarat was just the one parish. And I drove a lad home to near Winchelsea and while I was there, I remember going into his room and fumbling him while he was showing me something in the cupboard, toys or whatever, and putting my hand down his trousers and touching his penis. It would have, it would have been, it would have been a fairly brief kind of thing. Then later, the bishop called me in, Bishop O'Connor's and said there had been a complaint and he said um, if this thing happens again then you are off to the missions and he sent me to Mildura. So just stop there. Did the bishop yes. tell you what the complaint was? I, I can't even remember that. Well you speak about the complaint after you've talked about what happened at Villa Maria, is it the case that the bishop had a complaint about what you described as happening at Villa Maria? Well, I, I don't, I don't re 
remember any of that, but I believe it because it's there and that I made that statement in what was 1994. Yes. But I can't remember any of that now. No, no recollection of that. You said in 1994 that Bishop O'Collin said to you, you're off to the missions. What did that mean? I, I think that might be a mistake there. Um, there was a general, um, an expression that was used, uh, you are off, off the mission. The mission meaning um, working as a priest in a parish, but I think there's there's just a little bit of a, an error there. It shouldn't be, probably shouldn't be off to the missions, but off the mission, which Mr. would Mr. Ridsdale, Mr. Ridsdale, is it possible that there's no error? And what the bishop was saying was that he'd send you to some far distant place if you offended again. No, no, Your Honour, I don't think that's right. From what I remember of the the priestly kind of talk in those days, off the mission would mean being um, having your priesthood taken away or being taken away from parish work. Well, having your priesthood taken away is very serious, isn't it? It is. So how do we, we do understand at this point in time the bishop thought you'd done something seriously wrong? Well, I, I think so, but I can't. I can't put myself back in that situation and and remember what it was. But it just ha it just jumps out at me that that off to the missions is not an expression that that would have been around. I think it was off the mission. This may be only I may, might be only quibbling with with an expression or words, but. It was just something that seemed to jump out at me. You would have been troubled deeply by the thought that you could lose the priesthood when you were just in your first year as a priest, wouldn't you, Mr Ridsdale? I would have been, I would have been yes. Because you would have lost face with your family, wouldn't you? Yes. You would have lost the status... That, with, you would have lost the status you had as a priest? Yes, I would have lost faith with myself because I, I was a very proud person. Um, I, don't, I just would have been devastating. So did you reflect on what you had been doing with children and think about what you could do to stop doing it in the future so as to keep your priesthood? I don't know, Miss. I can't put myself back in that situation um, and know what I was thinking or would have been thinking or whether I was just panicking or what. I just don't know. Mr Ridstone... Looking back on it... Did it occur to you at the time that you were hurting the children? Oh, Your Honour, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Now, did Bishop O'Collins send you to somebody to counsel you about your behaviour with children? No, I don't think so. Not, not that I remember. I, I, I don't think so. Do you know I don't know. Do you know the name Dr Eric Seal? No, I don't. Have you heard of a psychologist by the name of Dr Seal? No, I haven't. I don't think I have. Can I ask you and those with you to turn to tab 116 
of that bundle. Have you got that in front of you? I have, yes. And you see the heading is Memorandum Redocument on File of GS, GF Ridsdale? I do, yes. And the signature at the bottom? Whose signature is that? Yeah, Ronald, Bal Ronald Balcones. You recognise his signature? Yes. And the third... I withdraw that. The first paragraph... Uh, Bishop Mulkerns was saying that he checked your file to ensure that there were there was not on the file any documents which should not have been retained. And he says in the course of checking the file, he removed and destroyed a letter which had been sent by a psychiatrist, Dr. R. E. Seal, to the late Bishop Collins, O. Collins. And then in the second paragraph, he says, the letter from Dr. Seal made no reference to the specific reason why Gerald Ridsdale had been referred to him by Bishop O'Collins. And to the best of his recollection of the letter that he had destroyed, Dr. Seal had seen Father Ridsdale as requested by the bishop, that he had found him cooperative and that he was confident that with appropriate care he could function well as a priest in the future. Now, does that help you recall seeing Dr. Seal? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I can't remember that at all. Was the only complaint that Bishop O'Collins brought to your attention the complaint that we've just been talking about? I, I don't know. I don't think... Can't remember that. Can you remember whether Bishop O'Collins talked to you about your conduct with children on any other occasion other than the one we've just been talking about? No. The first time you attended counselling, to your memory, was quite a bit later with Father Peter Evans, is that right? Yes, a Franciscan priest. But you've got no memory of seeing Dr. Seal? Dr. Seal, no. Never heard of Dr. Seal. Now, you were then appointed assistant priest at Mildura? Yes. And that appointment was made after you talked to Bishop O'Collins about the complaint that he had received. Do you remember that? Well, I don't, I don't remember it, but it, 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 it's in the document, so it must be, must be right. Well, you know from the document that Bishop O'Collins said to you uh, that if you continued doing it, you'd be off to mission or the missions. Yes. And then didn't he also say to you that um, he sent you to Mildura after that? And he, he sent me to Mildura, yes. When he sent you to Mildura, did he say that you should do anything in particular in relation to children? No, I don't know. I don't, don't remember him saying anything. Did he say that you should make sure that you weren't alone with any children? I, I don't know whether he did or not. Did he say to you that another priest was going to supervise you? No, I don't think so. I'm not can't remember that either. Do you know whether he placed any condition or restriction on how you were to operate as a <coughs> assistant priest in Mildura? No, I don't know. I don't think so. 
did he tell you that he had told anyone else at Mildura about what you had done? No. Did you expect him to have told anyone at Mildura about what you had done? I don't know. Did anyone say anything to you at Mildura to make you think they knew what you had done? No, not that I know of. When you got to Mildura, <coughs> the priest was Monsignor Day? Yes, that? that's right. He was the parish priest. Had you had anything to do with Monsignor Day before that? No, I don't think so, unless, unless it was to see him at a, at a retreat or at a, um, a meeting. I've never worked with him. You'd never worked with him before? No. Did you form a friendship with him through working with him as the assistant priest? Not really. Um, Kind of wasn't, um, it wasn't the thing for assistant priests and parish priests to be terribly friendly. Assistant priests were more, were more friendly with each other rather than with a parish priest. So there was quite a strict hierarchy in place, was there, in the church in those days? Yeah, there usually was, yes. Depended on personalities too, I think. An assistant priest there at the time was Father Dan Arundel? Yes, yes, I remember. And you and he lived together in the presbytery, didn't you, as assistant priests? That's right, yes. Did you talk to him about what had happened in the days before Bishop O'Collin spoke to you about the complaint? No, I, I, through, through my, my life, as far as I know, I've spoken to no one except uh, in legal matters or in counselling. But as far as friends or family or, or fellow priests, I had never talked to anyone. Well, by the time you are at Mildura, you knew that Bishop O'Collins knew that you had offended against a boy, didn't you? Yes. And you knew yes. that Bishop O'Collin said to you, if you did it again, you could no longer be a priest. Yes. Did you do anything to understand more about your offending so as to not do it again and therefore keep your priesthood? No, I don't think I did. You didn't talk to anyone to understand whether they had a similar problem to you and understand how they had dealt with it? No. Now, after Mildura, you offended against a number of boys, didn't you? Mainly older boys. I did, yes. Did you tell anyone about that offending? No. Did anyone say anything to you that made you suspect they knew about your offending? No, I don't think so. Now, after you were an assistant priest at Mildura, you were moved to Swan Hill. Remember that? Yes, 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 that's right. And you were assistant priest at Mildura for two or so years? No, I, I thought it would have been three, but... Was there anything about your leaving Mildura that was short of the time that ordinarily an assistant priest would spend at a parish? No, I don't think so. I, I, I still have the, 
the feeling that I was at Mildura for three years and Swan Hill for three years. That there was nothing unusual in your mind about going from Mildura to Swan Hill? No. You applied for the Swan Hill position? I don't know. The only logic I can see in it is that having been in Italy for two years, I was able to work with the Italian people in Mildura and then moved on to work with the Italian people in Swan Hill. So your memory is you put up your hand for Swan Hill after being in Mildura for about three years? No, we didn't put up our hand for anything. We were told to move. You were told to move by the bishop of the day? The bishop and the consultants would, would decide on the moves. Mm -hmm. And then we would get a letter to say that as from such and such a date, uh, you are to move to Swan Hill or wherever. And from your memory, that occurred about three years after you'd begun at Mildura? I think so. I've, I've always thought that. So you began at Swan Hill in about 1966? Yes, I'm not sure of the, the dates or the years, but yes, if that's what you've got there, I believe that. Just turn back with the transcript that you've got in front of you to page 14. Now, part of your job at Swan <coughs> Hill was to go and visit areas including Naya, NYAH West. Naya, no, yes. Now, when you were at Swan Hill, you abused a number of children for whom you were later convicted. Yes. In, yes. Addition, in addition to the children you abused, the subject of the convictions, you also told CCI in this interview that you've got in front of you that there were possibly two other altar boys. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah. Um there was more than this one. Yes, there would probably be another couple there. Now, you left Swan Hill to go to Warrnambool. Right. And you went to Warrnambool about 1967. Now, I think that probably is more likely to be 19... 70 that you went to war. No, if you look at page 15, it's 1970 to 1972, according to the document here. Thank you. You had spent what you thought was the normal three years at Swan Hill before you went to Warrnambool? Yes. And you were told in the usual manner that you were now being moved to Warrnambool? Yeah. I, I presume so. Did you indicate that you wanted particularly to go to Warrnambool? No, I don't. I, in those days, there wasn't a choice. There was no consultation with the system priest. It was just you go and you went. Was there any suggestion to you that anyone in the hierarchy of the church in the diocese knew that you had been offending in Swan Hill? No, I don't know. I don't think so, but I'm, I, I wouldn't know. Did any rumours come to your attention about what you were doing in Swan Hill? No, I don't think so. So as far as you knew, when you left Swan Hill, no one knew about your offending? Yes. Now, you went to become assistant priest at Warrnambool after Swan Hill? Yes. Yeah. 
Now, if you look at page 19 of your interview, now you say there that you were overworked in Swan Hill. And you say that the three years were about up and you think you said to the parish priest, I just have to get here. Perhaps that might be get out of here. Do you see that in the fourth line? Yes, I had, I had a bit of a breakdown, I think, in Swan Hill. Never work. Well, was the breakdown contributed to by the fact that you knew you were offending against children? No, the breakdown, as far as I remember now, was um, doing the normal parish work and there was, I think, some special um, project, like a parish mission or, or um, something that was, that was going on, and, and I was given the responsibility for that as well. I can't remember what that was now, but I know that I had too much, too much on my plate. Was it also the case that you knew you were committing crimes against children while you were at Swan Hill, and that you knew that if you were found out, you could well lose your priesthood? No, I, I can't look back and say yes or no to that. Mm -hmm. After Bishop O'Collins told you some years back that if you continued to offend against children, you could no longer be a priest. Did that prey on your mind while you were working in subsequent parishes? Oh, it could have, but I can't say whether it did or not. Did you go to confession in those years that you were an assistant priest after speaking to Bishop O'Collins? Oh, I don't know. Not, not very much, I think. What did you tell I them? Might, I, might have done, I might have done when I went to the annual priest retreat or something like that, but I, I haven't got much of a recollection or remembrance of, of going to confession or how often. Do you remember whether after Bishop O'Collins told you about the complaint and while you were an assistant priest at various parishes, you told a confessor of your offending against children? Oh, I'm sorry, would you just repeat that again? Certainly. After Bishop O'Collins told you about the complaint in your first year as a priest and while you were an assistant priest at the various parishes we've spoken about, did you go to confession and tell your confessor that you had been offending against children? No, I think I've already said that I've never taught, as, as far as I know, I've never talked to anyone, and certainly not in confession either, about offending against children. If you had told a confessor, would you expect that that priest would have to keep quiet about what you had said and not tell anyone? I don't know. That's, that's a what if question. And, and I mean, well, the you... answer is what if. I don't know. I don't know. What, what was your understanding in the 60s and 70s about what was told to a confessor and whether it could be told to anyone else? Um, that everything told in confession was to be kept secret. You're on another time. Now, now, now there's a, a different understanding of that. And I think there's, if, if it's, if there's a danger to other people or to the person who's confessing, then I think the priest can or should do something about it. I'm not sure of that, but that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
that's just the impression that I have now. Where have you gained that impression from, Mr. Vista? From talking with people, from reading things? What? Um, no, I think it's just from reading, from reading, from um, documents. Um, I was going to say from from television, but I'm not I'm not sure where it comes from. But that, and I'm I'm not sure whether that's come out in in court reporting or where. But I that's the impression that I have now. And do you think that? But I right? think in the days when I in the days when I was um, sort of working as a priest, everything told in confession was to be kept secret, private. Do you think it's a good thing if indeed what was said to the confessioner, in the confessional, if it was a crime, that the confessor should tell someone, including the police? Well, now, from my experience and what I've done and the damage that I've done, I'll say yes, definitely yes. I don't know what the uh, what the church ruling or legislation or thought is about that, but that's my personal opinion. Mr. Ritzdale, we're going to <clears throat> we're going to break now and have some refreshment. We'll come back in about half an hour's time. You understand? Thanks, Your Honour. Yeah, Thanks, well. Your Honour. Thanks. We'll adjourn.